Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar entitled Preprints and Other MDPI Initiatives. Thank you very much for joining us today. This webinar has been planned within the celebration of the Open Access Week and we have two speakers that will talk about preprints and other options for open access. Our first speaker will be Dr. Unai Vicario, who joined MDPI in May of 2016. And after working as co-managing editor for several journals since 2020, he serves as publisher manager in Barcelona to develop constructive relationships with learned societies and institutions. He will start talking about press. And after that, we will have Dr. Jessica Polka, the executive director of ASAP Bio, that we will be discussing uh, in more detail the increasing importance of preprints in the realm of scholarly publishing. Jessica is also a Plan S ambassador, an affiliate of the Knowledge Futures Group, and a steering committee member of Rescuing Biomedical Research. Uh, finally, Dr. Vicario will continue the webinar talking about other MDPI initiatives for open access. I would like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and that we will also have a YouTube live streaming today. The recording will be posted on the webinar webpage for everyone to watch it as soon as possible. So that is everything for my part. I will now hand out the microphone to Dr. Vicario and everyone enjoy. Thank you very much, Anna. I, I hope that everybody can hear me properly. I will start sharing my screen. So thank you everybody for being today here attending this webinar on preprints and other MDPI initiatives that we prepared on on the Open Access Week for 2020. Um, today, we will be uh, presenting different MDPI uh, services, initiatives, and we will be focusing mainly on preprints. But uh, as Sana said, uh, we will have uh, Jessica, Dr. Jessica Volka talking about preprints also with us. And when, uh, when this is over, we will continue with presenting the rest of MDPI initiatives. So, as you may know, academic journals are not always uh, the first place where uh, researchers de disseminate their, uh, their research. Uh, sometimes uh, they need to, to publish it uh, in a fast way, and we have the option to, to make the information available through preprints, which are not uh, peer reviewed. And it's information that is uh, going online without this uh, peer review process. In MDPI, we will have our own MDPI uh, preprint uh, platform. It's a multidisciplinary platform covering different areas of knowledge. And uh, we are not very original, but we call it preprints, but, uh, so that it's quite clear. Um, yeah, preprints have been, uh, have been increasing popularity during the last years. Uh, there are more and more disciplines that are getting used to preprints. And until now, uh, the main use for them was to make um, information available to the general public before a formal publication in the journal. But uh, what we have seen is that uh, today with the, within the open access environment, uh, there are more uh, new uses that are, uh, that have been, preprints are being used for, for new uses. Uh, we have seen that uh, they are being uh, used for making available uh, in the open access format those papers that have been uh, published uh, in traditional publishers under the subscription model, uh, what is called the green open access. They are also used to make available for the public uh, publishing research, uh, publish, sorry, research data sets, uh, code of uh, programs, or to publish uh, supplementary materials that perhaps have to be wrote to be published in, uh, in general articles. And uh, I have not included here, but uh, we have also seen just the contrary. Uh, these people who uh, may have some useful information for the, for the community, for the scientific community, but perhaps it's not enough to, to prepare a full article. And preprints are also being used to, to share with the, with the community uh, recent findings that uh, even if it's not enough to prepare an, an article maybe of the interest of the community. So 
as I was saying, uh, there are uh, more and more uh, research areas that are uh, of different disciplines that are uh, discovering preprints as a useful tool. Until some years ago, uh, it was mainly physical sciences and there were some social sciences that were uh, using preprints. They have been doing, doing this for decades. But uh, today, there are more disciplines um, that are starting to get used to preprints. And I'm sharing here just uh, uh, a chart with, uh, we got from our uh, platform, where you can see that um, physical sciences and social sciences are not any longer the ones uh, leading this, uh, um, I mean, they are not any, any, any longer the ones with a, a bigger support, with a, which are supporting preprints, sorry. So um, we can see that there are uh, areas like engineering or life sciences that are getting very used to, to use these uh, preprints. Still there are, I mean, there is still a lot of work to do because not all the areas uh, are used to preprints, but uh, this is something that uh, Dr. Polka will talk about later on. Uh, in the current uh, situation with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, preprints have been shown, have shown to be very useful, uh, but they have been uh, useful not only for researchers, but also for policymakers and the general public who has been very interested in, uh, in following and getting updated information uh, on the research which was being done on this area. And uh, I wanted to show you uh, this picture that I'm sharing here, which was taken in the conference we prepared for our journal viruses this year in 2020. As you can imagine, this year, uh, this conference was a, a complete success. And I'm, I'm showing it because the, uh, the presenter in the, uh, in, this, in the picture was showing on the slide on her work on coronaviruses. And she was citing a preprint as a reference to support the data. Uh, this shows that the preprints uh, are really useful when there is an urgency to, to transmit information. There is an urgency to make the, the research available. And uh, this year, this is especially true. With the increasing popularity of preprints, uh, there were also some questions, some doubts about how the quality of the quality standards were being kept. And I wanted to show here that uh, even if we get some uh, amount of preprints, we are not publishing, we are not making all of them available to the general public. Today, we are only uh, in MDPI, we are only publishing about the 57% of the preprints that we get. And this is possible because uh, in our workflow, we do, even if there is not a, a peer review process, we do have a screening uh, where we will mainly check the, if there is any plagiarism issue, if there is any um, ethical concern, if the research has been published formally in another journal, or uh, mainly if there is, if the research that we are uh, presenting is uh, of the interest of the community. This process can take about 24 and 48 hours from the moment the, the paper is uh, submitted to the moment that the information is made available online. And uh, this is possible because we have people, um, um, internal staff, but also volunteers screening those, um, those preprints. I would like to mention here that if anyone who is now attending this uh, webinar is interested in, in helping us screen those uh, preprints, you can access the, the website www.preprints.org and there you will have the opportunity to submit your CV and uh, start helping with this process. So before going on, I will now allow Jessica to continue talking about preprints. And when she's done, uh, I will continue to introduce the rest of the services by MDPI. Jessica. Thank you so much, Junai. Um, I'm very happy to speak today uh, from my own perspective within the biomedical sciences about how preprints are transforming that discipline. 
So let me just bring my slides up here and uh, hopefully you're able to see them now. Um, so uh, just as a brief overview of what I'll speak about today, a little bit more about the motivation for why researchers in the life sciences are sharing preprints. I'll put that into the context of current events in terms of funder policies and COVID-19. Then I'll describe some trends and feedback and review of preprints, how they relate to open access and a possible vision for the future. So I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation, the introduction, by way of further disclosing my perspectives uh, and uh, the frame at which I view this. My background is in basic biomedical sciences. Uh, and during my postdoc, um, I uh, became interested in publishing and ASAP Bio is now a small nonprofit um, that works to convene uh, kind of communities together to talk about culture change and how we can promote uh, the use of preprints and open peer review to best benefit uh, science. So uh, the founder of ASAP Bio, Ron Vail, uh, really got this started with a paper he published in 2015, showing that over the past 30 years, time to publication for the first paper from a graduate student in his program had increased by about a year. So even though we have so much technology to help us collect data faster, to share information over the web, it's actually taking students longer than ever to put their first paper out. Preprints are one way to help accelerate this process because they can be made available immediately whenever the author decides. And oftentimes in the life sciences, this is around the same time as journal submission, but of course it doesn't have to be as we'll discuss later. Uh, the benefits of making the work available publicly at this time are that there can be community feedback, discussion, and uh, the uh, and catalyzing new work and new development, new research within potential collaborators and the field as a whole. Obviously, science depends upon the availability of information from other researchers, and preprints are a way of disseminating work uh, decoupled from its evaluation. And by decoupling these two processes, one of which can take a very long time through cycles of peer review, um, the process of scientific discovery can be accelerated. So in the life sciences, among papers that are uh, appearing on Europe PubMed Central, which is a European mirror of, of PMC, there is a, a mean of, uh, median, excuse me, of four to five months between the preprint version or I should say the first preprint version and the final publication. So as you can imagine, this time is a time when researchers can get credit and recognition for their preprint, incorporate additional feedback, and also this can help accelerate uh, discovery overall. This survey was conducted by Richard Sever et al. from BioArchive, and they surveyed BioArchive users to understand um, the uh, benefits of preprints. And they found that um, the uh, really high percentage of respondents said that preprints helped increase awareness of their research, but that there's also many other benefits in terms of making connections um, and uh, you know, perhaps advancing your career. So I think these benefits are a major part of the reason why there has been such dramatic growth in biomedical preprints over the past few years. Uh, now, preprints in biomedicine are being submitted at a rate of about 8% that of all the literature on PubMed. And as you can see from this graph, this is distributed across several different servers, um, but there's been particularly rapid growth um, over the past few months. Um, I think that supporting this growth is the support of policies from funders and uh, technology organizations that support publishing infrastructure. Um, and most recently, just this summer, the full text of preprints has appeared on PubMed, Europe PMC, and preprints are now appearing on PubMed as well. This represents further integration of preprints into the more traditional infrastructure of discovery. Uh, and we track these policies online on our website. However, I do want to point out, um, uh, given the kind of the uh, prevailing themes of Open Access Week as well, the fact that preprinting uh, is not necessarily distributed equally um, or evenly across all researchers. 
So while preprinting does inherently remove barriers to sharing knowledge in that there are no fees to posting preprints, no fees for reading preprints, um, there can be other barriers to sharing work, such as concerns about scooping, um, a lack of uh, recognition of the practice within a given field or, or discipline or, or university or, or geographic context. Um, and language barriers as well, I think, are uh, changing the way that researchers from different countries are choosing to share their work. So this graph represents uh, work on bioarchive. And so this doesn't include all preprint servers. And I should say that there are many um, fantastic language specific preprint servers as well. But just to make the point that um, as a fraction of senior author preprints, um, there are certain countries that are overrepresented in how many preprints they're posting per all of the citable documents their country is producing and others that are underrepresented. And finally, um, throughout the last months of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been effects, especially on female first authors, both in traditional published literature and also uh, in preprints, uh, as you can see from this analysis. And um, I think that it's interesting that this appears to be differentially affecting different disciplines as well. Um, so obviously COVID-19, as I already alluded to, has provided a, a unique mandate to share data rapidly. Um, and many, many different servers have contributed to uh, the growing literature on COVID-19, which is being shared first as a preprint. Um, and, and then, you know, I think later as time has gone on, the fraction of preprints has um, become more you know, representative to the overall literature, but especially early on during the pandemic, uh, preprints were a very important mechanism for sharing information early. And this has resulted in uh, a real change in the way that the popular media is representing preprints. Um, maybe for the first time, there is attention not only to individual preprints by a broad spectrum of journalists, but also uh, the sort of meta attention on the way that preprints are affecting uh, how, how science is communicated. So um, with some co-authors, we looked at the differential attention on COVID-19 preprints uh, these data are based on bioarchive and medarchive, but um, there's you know, basically an order of magnitude increase in the abstract views, downloads, citations, tweets, et cetera. So COVID-19 preprints are certainly under a spotlight, uh, both for researchers and non-researchers. This perhaps feeds into a, uh, the results of a survey that ASAP Bio and uh, attendees of a workshop that we organized earlier this year um, uh, in collaboration with other organizations. Uh, it shows that among the concerns about preprinting, premature media coverage of preprints is actually the top concern. I think that this is very much uh, a, um, related to when this survey was conducted. Um, you know, I think that this is a new trend, um, but the fact that there is this anxiety over how preprints are being represented and how they're talked about in the uh, more popular press, I think is, is uh, very reasonable given the important implications release of information can have. So ASAP Bio has just started a project uh, called Preprints in the Public Eye to address some of these issues. We are uh, interested in developing we're talking about best practices for labeling preprints um, and whether uh, readers who are non-specialists interpret those labels uh, as they might be intended, and also how peer review and preprints can be best represented by institutions and researchers and journalists as well. Um, so I think you know one example uh, that I think typifies um, concerns about preprints in the pandemic, but also the potential to rapidly improve the dissemination of information is this preprint that was posted in early January, which suggested that there might be similarities between HIV and uh, uh, the coronavirus. But within just 48 hours of its posting, it garnered dozens of comments and was withdrawn by the authors very rapidly. So um, I think that this 
suggests that this type of rapid turnaround allows uh, problematic research to be identified um, by a huge community. So certainly larger than just the a few reviewers who would be seeing a paper if this were submitted without a preprint. Um, and the paper was corrected very rapidly um, in the context of uh, the normal timescales for turning around retractions and so forth. So um, I think that, that at the core of this, we need to acknowledge that science is itself an iterative process where corrections are things that should be normalized and encouraged and preprints make this process faster and easier. Um, I wanna point out that this preprint um, received a, a very large number of comments. Um, I think that the rate of commenting, so not all preprints receive comments in the comments section, but a really significant fraction, again, from the survey that I mentioned earlier, um, there a significant fraction of respondents receive feedback via Twitter. Uh, and certainly also by private means, by email and talking to colleagues, et cetera. So, you know, just as an example of the type of interactions that are possible with this kind of feedback, Daniel Quintana has this very interesting story um, where he posted a preprint on um, OSF and then talked about it in this Facebook group where there was this really rich conversation uh, that happened among uh, the group members. Uh, Daniel then reports that he reached out to one of these people who's <laughs> leaving the substantial feedback. And this person actually became a co-author on a subsequent version of the paper. So I think this really speaks to the power of um, community feedback to strengthen a paper in ways that go beyond even the traditional peer review process. And perhaps this is uh, one of the reasons why not only funders, but also publishers are calling for more public review of preprints. Um, so in April, there was this uh, uh, OASPA coalition, which called not only for reviewers to review papers really quickly and allow their identities to be transferred, but also to um, rigorously review preprints um, even before they're submitted to a journal. So the idea being that with more eyes on a preprint, it can help inform the journal process. So uh, ASAP Bio has a project called Reimagine Review, where we are cataloging um, not only some of the innovative review efforts that are being uh, implemented by journals, but projects that specifically seek to address preprints as well. Um, and so I don't have time to go into the, to all of them right now, but um, there are many projects, including pre-lights, pre-review, um, uh, rapid reviews, COVID-19, uh, ASAP Bio has a project together uh, with EMBO called Review Commons, but uh, peer community in um, peer of science, a variety of projects that are seeking to uh, provide reviews on preprints directly. So I encourage you to look at these because I think that each one brings a different approach to this question of how to encourage more review to occur on preprints. So we're hosting an event to try to tackle this problem of promoting additional review on preprints. How can we make it easier um, to conduct this review? I think that right now the ecosystem is very fragmented. Um, it can be unclear. Uh, whether review is desired by the authors um, or who will be using the review. But um, we can see many different ways of incentivizing and encouraging people to feedback uh, to authors on their preprints. So this design sprint really seeks to develop those ideas for encouraging feedback on preprints. And it's gonna be split over two different days and there's a process for submitting a proposal if you're interested or if you just like to attend, and provide feedback to the project leads, we would be uh, delighted for that as well. So uh, because it's open access week, I do wanna spend just a few minutes talking about the relationship of preprints and open access. Um, I think that preprints are often called open access publications, um, but I think uh, that it's important to um, understand that um, that can vary depending upon the license that's applied. And also, um, sometimes preprints are not equivalent to the final version that comes out of a journal. 
Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about, um, about that right now. So um, during this analysis that I mentioned earlier, we took a sample of about 200 papers that were um, published in, uh, in journals after appearing on BioArchive. We compared um, the, uh, we looked at the abstracts of the original paper and the published version. And um, we also looked at the figures and whether content in the figures had been, uh, in tables had been removed or rearranged, et cetera. So I think that um, now these are subjective judgments. We basically looked at the two abstracts side by side and said, you know, does this abstract have, uh, have the conclusions been toned down? Has something really significant been added or removed from the conclusions? And we did see that there's a small fraction of preprints that have this kind of major change, a, a pretty significant fraction of preprints where the language is sort of toned down or strengthened. And while the majority of preprints don't change significantly between the, the abstract and the published paper, you know, there's also content that gets added uh, or possibly rearranged. And actually, just as a, to really drive this point home, this uh, analysis we actually removed from the second version of this preprint um, because we are spinning it out um, into something a bit more evolved. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, preprints are need to be considered um, independently. They're not equivalent to the final version of a paper. Um, and I think uh, com compounding this issue is the fact that some publishers have different policies regarding when updates to preprints can be made. So as you know, uh, preprints can be versioned. You can upload a new version uh, to provide updates over time. Um, some publishers allow updates to be posted at any time during the peer review process, and others do not. And when updates are prohibited, um, that I think restricts authors from sharing uh, information that could have been gathered, you know, uh, feedback on the preprint itself, and also restricts the preprint from uh, representing the most recent version of the, the paper. Um, so just to track the policies of publishers regarding which version of a preprint can be posted in the transposed database, but I definitely think that checking journal policies is always done on the website of the individual journal. Um, and finally, I think that also influencing this issue of non-equivalency between preprints and the, and the version of record, some preprint servers also enable postprints or versions after acceptance of the journal and uh, function as a more general repository for, um, for a discipline, whereas others do not and are really specifically intended for posting manuscripts prior to acceptance. So we have a database of preprint server policies re relevant to the life sciences on our website. Um, and you can find out uh, this kind of information about what type of content is accepted there. So um, are all preprints open access? Um, I think it depends how you define open access. Um, so uh, for example, on PubMed Central, there's a bunch of literature that is free to read, but uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's free to reuse, that the content can be, uh, for example, translated into another language or annotated and hosted on a different website. Um, so, you know, I think that there is this idea commonly about open access as meaning that the content is free to read, but open access is broader than that. It's about how the content can be reused and how uh, that reuse can prompt further uh, discoveries. So um, on a preprint server that allows authors to choose which license to apply, the most open license, um, which is uh, CC BY, is chosen a minority of times. Um, we've done some surveys over the years about this. I think that um, licenses are a really complicated topic, um, but uh, we have created some resources to help authors understand um, how the different license choices can influence how their preprint might be reused. Um, and obviously this is way too much to go into here, but there's a range that are available at different servers. Um, I just wanna point out that CC BY um, is encouraged by the National Biomedical Funder here in the United States. 
It fits with the, the kind of original definition of open access, and it is um, promoted as the default choice or the the uh, the only choice at many preprint servers, including, I believe, preprints.org, which I think is a, a strong way of promoting open access. And next, I think related to this concept of open science is the idea of data and code availability. Um, so uh, several different preprint servers are making available the opportunity to link out to data and code. And I think this is really valuable regarding making the entirety of a work uh, supported and open access. So if you'd like to read more about licenses, uh, we have a blog post that's out actually um, just this week. Uh, which you can check out uh, on our website, asapbio.org. So if I can just spend the last few minutes here talking a little bit about what we could envision the future preprints to look like. Um, so I'll go back to the very beginning of the talk when Ron Vale showed that it's taking graduate students longer than ever to create a paper. He also showed in the same paper that currently individual papers within a variety of different journals now have many more figure panels than they did 30 years ago, even if you exclude the supplemental material, which is a new phenomenon. So now it's taking authors much more material to put together what is considered a complete story. And if you think about it, um, just changing um, preprinting, so just, just preprinting at the time of submission will save time, but there's a limit to how much time is saved because we are now all struggling to put together these mammoth stories that take many years to assemble. So the point in which we feel comfortable um, seeking credit for the work is really far along this entire process of discovery. However, I think there's a different trend going on, a reversal of this trend with COVID-19 preprints. We saw that the average COVID-19 preprint on BioArchive or MedArchive is about half of the length of the non-COVID-19 preprints, and they have fewer references, and they're also likely to be updated more frequently. So is this a vision for how we could use preprints to disseminate information more rapidly? I'll give you another example. This is a non-COVID preprint that was actually posted uh, in January, um, where uh, a, the, the journal, the version that was posted on the preprint server at this time, and also based upon the journal um, dates submitted to the journal is about eight figures. Um, and so as you can see, these authors saved, you know, about seven months in the dissemination of the work to the public with this version. And this is kind of, I think, typical of how people are using preprints. But that's not all the authors did. This is actually the third version of this preprint. About a year earlier, they posted a three-figure version of the preprint, which they subsequently open, uh, updated over time. And back in uh, February of 2019, this work was visible, it was citable, um, and it was recognized by the community in the server where it was posted. So I just want to put forth this hypothetical question. If it were normal to post a very short preprint, and I think when I alluded to this in his introduction, if it were possible to post um, and uh, figures, like a single figure, a short report, how much time could we save in the community recognition of this, additional feedback to the authors, and the development of science overall? Um, I think it would save a lot of time, a lot of energy, while still allowing for that final credit of journal publication uh, as normal. So I think this is really a way of accelerating open science and practicing open science in a highly visible way that uh, also permits journal publication just as you need for career advancement. Um, and just to say that I think that this, in this case, uh, the authors posted a little revision summary which describes how the content changed I think there's a lot of concerns that if this becomes common practice, there will be an overload of information. It'll be hard to keep track. Um, this is a way for authors to provide an update on how uh, they progress their paper. 
And I think it's you know really cool that some journals are also linking backwards to the preprint as well, so the entire publication history can be transparently disclosed. So what do we want to see? Um, I think that this time savings that we're already seeing on preprinting is fantastic. But what if um, there were a movement to post preprints even earlier and to develop the work out in the open? I think we would see a much greater shift in uh, the, the time between the first public sharing that's creditable, that's citable, that's vis visible, and the final publication in the journal version. And this can benefit and accelerate science overall. Okay, so um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the rest of the event. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was really interesting. I'm sure there will be some questions afterwards. Um, let me show them now. So again, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, I will now continue to, to present the, the rest of MDPI services and initiatives. Uh, I think that this can be of the interest of the audience since most of them are available for free. And um, they may be really useful for librarians and, and researchers. Um, I will start talking about the MDPI books, which uh, today we are offering more than 2,000 uh, open access books uh, completely available for free and uh, in the open access format. These books can be downloaded, can be accessed, and can be shared with the community. Um, and we do also offer the opportunity to transform them into the ebook format. And uh, this will allow to uh, create a, a hard copy that uh, they are available for uh, a fee. As I was saying, the, the books have some uh, advantages. This, uh, open access books, uh, the authors will keep uh, the copyright of the, of the book. Uh, everything is available to the general public. And as we were commenting before, uh, they are, the, our books are uh, published under the CC BY license, which uh, means that uh, you can access it, you can download it, you can print it, you can share it. Uh, every, almost everything is, um, permitted. What we do protect a little bit more is the book format that we uh, usually uh, publish under the Creative Commons attribution, but in the non-commercial and non-derivative uh, license, which means that the only thing that we don't, not, uh, we don't allow for NDPI books is, is to uh, download them, print them, and sell them. But uh, the rest of non-commercial uh, uses are completely uh, allowed. So we we have different types of uh, books. Uh, we can have special issue uh, reprints, which are collections of uh, articles uh, published in a special issue that are formatted in a uh, in a book and can be downloaded downloaded or uh, printed. Then we have also high quality editions. We have monographs, textbooks, and we also offer reports and project uh, reports for projects and conferences. And uh, we are now developing and should be available soon. Um, a book, uh, it will be a book builder. To select some articles of interest and uh, collecting them also uh, in a, into a book, in, a book, in the format of a in book format. Uh, and we believe that this uh, can be of the interest of uh, people who may be interested in, in, a, uh, in a certain topic or authors who have uh, and decide that uh, they would like to have all the articles collected in, in a book. Uh, I'm sure that also it can be of the interest of your audience. So, but this is something that is still being uh, created, but we expect to have it available soon and we will see which will be the, the interest of the public. So a question that we always uh, get when we are talking about open access books is uh, whether they are peer reviewed. 
and the answer is yes. Uh, all the all the books that are published in uh, by MDPI are reviewed by experts, which is true that uh, perhaps this peer review is not uh, the peer review that we are used to for um, for scholar articles. Uh, it may happen that we have an, an editor and then we have someone else, uh, ex, ex, some external reviewer, or if we are publishing several chapters, it may happen that the authors from each chapter is uh, cross uh, reviewing the, the rest of the, of the chapters. But at the end, we ensure that all, uh, all the books are reviewed and that the ethical policies and standards are, are kept. That was about books. Uh, we do also have a science forum, which is an, a uh, sorry, it's an event planning platform uh, that was launched by NDPI in 2019. Uh, nine, sorry, it's eleven years now. So uh, it's uh, it's a very useful platform because it uh, it can save a lot of time to conference organizers uh, since you can manage most most of the uh, administrative tasks that are required in the, when organizing uh, a conference or an event. You can handle from from uh, from Sage Forum. You can manage uh, setting up the, the website, uh, scheduling the I mean preparing the schedule for the for the meeting. There you can manage the registration, the submissions, and basically all the services that are shown here in the in the slide. And uh, we expect Sage Forum to be uh, an environment for scholar, uh, scholarly exchange to that will allow uh, also to create new networks and establish collaborations. So uh, for, for both physical and online conferences, uh, when talking about physical conferences, as I was saying, it can be useful for handling the, the registration, the review process for the, for the works that are submitted. Uh, yeah, uh, we, you can also manage the, the website from there. And it's the same for the case of online conferences that as you can imagine this, this year have been quite popular. Uh, um, it, in this case, online conferences, we usually allow them to be uh, longer in time. We will probably have the, um, the abstracts, posters, videos uh, online, and then we will allow a forum of uh, discussion around the presentations, and this will be uh, going on for one week or, or two. I would also like to mention that this year, uh, during the last four, four months, we have already prepared like uh, 35 webinars, all of them uh, available for free to September this year about new approaches to evaluate research impact and planners and uh, the price transparency in open access. Um, I'm mentioning them because they are related to the Basel Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Publishing Forum that will be starting next Monday, 26. Uh, I believe that this can also be of the interest of the, of the audience today. Uh, both webinars are available online. You can access them through these links. And if you are interested in, um, in price transparency, I, I would recommend the second one where you, could, uh, you will be able to, to find our CEO, uh, Mrs. Deria Mihaila, talking about uh, price transparency also in, in MDPI, since uh, she was one of the speakers in the, in the webinar. We, we do also have a side lead. SiteLit is, uh, is a comprehensive scholar literature database. Today we have uh, over 125 million entries with papers, preprints, proceedings, and, and book chapters. Uh, it's used monthly uh, by more than 75,000 uh, 75, uh, users, and we expect that uh, if the audience finds this uh, presentation interesting, we, we will be having more users soon. Um, we use it also to provide bibliographic data uh, to, to other platforms, like uh, now we are using it for our internal site, prof site profiles, but we expect to have all, uh, also to use it also for uh, external platforms. So, 
And uh, Sizely, this is very useful for us because uh, it provides a lot of information. It, uh, it's easy to visualize a lot of information about uh, publishers and journals. And it's also useful to prepare some rankings. So we can we can use Sizely to to provide um, to show, for instance, the top uh, publishers by number of articles or the top publishers by number of articles by open access articles, sorry, more open access um, articles today. Sorry. So we can also use Silit to check which has been the open access um, trend during the last years. As you can see here, uh, open access articles uh, are being uh, are increasing every year and, uh, and the trend is very clear. And I will also say that perhaps in 2018, even if it's just a, uh, a period of one year, we can see the effect of the plan S that was uh, published, in, published in 2018 by the Commission S. And uh, it's, it's useful, not only because of this uh, info, but we can also check the profiles of different uh, journals, not only NDPI journals, but uh, any journal that we can think about. And uh, here we can find information about who is the current publisher of the, of the journal, if the journal is published in open access or not, which is the indexing, the number of uh, articles and open access articles published per year. Uh, we can also see if they have any kind of uh, agreement for the long-term preservation of manuscripts. So this can also be of help to, to the research community. And now before fin finalizing, I will just go uh, briefly to two new initiatives that we are also launching in MBPI. We have Site Profiles, uh, which is a social media, uh, a social network, sorry, for uh, researchers and scholars, and uh, it aims to accelerate the discovery. Uh, and we also expect it to be a forum for discussion and that it will be helpful to create new networks and collaborations. So um, we expect academics uh, to use this to highlight their contributions to, to the research communities. And, uh, and we expect that this will be a way of measuring the impact in the field beyond publication numbers and impact factor. We were aware of the importance of the impact factor, but we, we think that there is research that can be really useful for the community. That it's not always uh, backed by this uh, impact factor disseminate this valuable information. So this is the how it looks like. Uh, Such profile is a uh, uh, we can have a, a profile for the for each of the researchers showing the amount of publications, the, which publications they have, the conferences attended, projects, which is the network of that person, and uh, it will allow discussion and so on. So uh, we automatically provide or prepare an, a profile for each of our authors. For, uh, for every author submitting to NDPI, we will prepare automatically a, a site profile. But it's not uh, exclusive, so anyone who is interested in uh, in this in set profiles can access the website and, and resist it. And uh, just to finish, I will uh, briefly mention Encyclopedia, which is an online reference uh, created and created by active scholars. We, we expect this to be an, uh, to provide a very specific professional and benchmark information for, for the scholar community. Uh, of course, uh, this, is, this is similar to the famous Wikipedia, but in this case only uh, academics can, uh, can publish and modify the content that is being published. So we will expect to be a professional uh, reference. For the, for the society. Uh, of course, everything is published in the CC BY license uh, in Encyclopedia, open access. And even if it's uh, something new that we are now starting to, uh, to develop, we are already contacting those authors who are submitting uh, review articles, review uh, topic reviews to, to MDPI, 
And we, once the review is published, we ask them to modify it uh, so that it might fit and uh, define one of uh, a topic that will be published in Encyclopedia. So this was everything on my side. Uh, once again, thank you very much for being here. And uh, now we will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Unai. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I see that we have at least three questions in the QA box. We will start with them, but if anyone has any question, please, this is the time to post it in the QA box and we will discuss it at the end. So first of all, we have a couple of questions from Shad Nawahab. Um, the first question is, are the preprints only for research articles? Um, I think that uh, different servers have different policies. For example, um, uh, you know, some servers only allow research articles or articles describing primary research. Um, but there are other servers that have different policies on the type of content that is accepted. So again, I think it's important to check each individual server policy. This is something that is included in the directory that I mentioned. Um, but again, I think the preprint server website is the best source uh, for this type of information. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question I think is for you, Nai. Um, Chatma is also asking, uh, what is the APC for books? Uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, the, the article, the book, sorry, can be downloaded for free. Uh, all the articles that are, are available for free. Uh, of course, uh, there is a price for uh, hard copies. If you want to get them, uh, we can for sure pro uh, provide them and deliver them. But uh, there is uh, there is a price for that. I'm not sure about the the price that we are uh, that we have now for the books, but uh, it's available online. You will find uh, uh, if you enter if you access the the website, you will find the the fees for uh, publishing. I mean, for, uh, there will be also a fee if the if the I mean if someone came and, and asked to to prepare a new book and if we need to take care of the of the revision of the book and preparing everything. But uh, again, this is uh, something that is available online, and you can always uh, contact uh, the website and the and the email that you will find there. We do have a. Uh, a person responsible for this project and they will provide an answer as fast as possible. Okay. Um, this, there is an anonymous attendee that wanted to ask, um, is there a follow time frame between the preprint and the actual research paper to be published in terms of, of the val validity of the data? So I strongly believe that we should not draw conclusions between any delays between the posting of a preprint and the appearance of the data in a peer-reviewed format. Um, there are many reasons why these delays might exist. Uh, for example, it could be that the paper has been rejected by multiple journals. That's absolutely possible. It could also be that the researchers ran out of funds, that there's not uh, the time and energy available to publish the paper in a journal um, or the APCs, for example, in some cases. Um, I, I think that uh, preprints really need to be evaluated based on their own merits um, by looking at the paper or by gaining um, feedback from experts in the fields who are looking at the paper. Uh, so I think that in addition to that, there's also some researchers who feel that a preprint is sufficient and that the work does not need to be published in a journal for a variety of different reasons. So I think it's really important to um, evaluate the work in a preprint in its own merit. Okay. Um, regarding the these, these different areas of expertise, uh, in fact, Joanna Chiobotaro ask uh, what are the main areas of expertise of the preprints that we are seeing now in 2020? Okay, in, uh, in MDPI I was saying before that uh, engineering is, uh, is the main area that it's uh, showing. Uh, I mean, we are getting more papers from uh, more preprints 
for, for this area, also followed by life sciences and biology and biosciences. But uh, of course, this, is, uh, this information is just lim limited to, to the information we have as a preprints in MDPI. So for a general view, I think that it's better that Jessica can provide her feedback. Um, yeah, I, th I think that, uh, you know, as you know, I mentioned in his introduction, the physical sciences have been using preprints for a very long time. The preprint server archive was founded um, in, uh, you know, basically in the, in the 90s, and it's receiving, I think, about 100,000 preprints per year. Um, however, there's also a really large number of preprints being circulated at FSRN. Um, which is for social sciences and REPEC, which is the network for economics. Um, so I think that actually life sciences, even though there's a really large volume of life sciences literature overall, is pretty far uh, behind these other disciplines in the, uh, the, in the posting of preprints. Um, and I should say that within life sciences, certain disciplines like neuroscience is, is of course a large field um, but others like uh, the computational biology, genomics have been quick to adopt preprints. And so um, I think it's, it's reasonable that the usage of preprints is higher proportional to the overall literature there. But I think this is a big challenge. Um, it, right now, I'm not aware of any analysis of the representatives as a fraction of the literature published overall over all these different servers. Um, but uh, yeah, I think just to the general trends would echo probably what uh, Sinai had mentioned. Okay. So anyone, okay, we have another question uh, from Ana Andrea Tioca. How are MDPI preprints promoted currently in the academic area? Is there any strategy for promotion? So, uh, yeah, we are promoting them. I mean, yeah, since the moment we started with our uh, platform, we are promoting them in scientific conferences and we are promoting, uh, of course, we are doing some marketing campaigns within our journals and among the, our uh, authors. Uh, I'm aware that perhaps this is not something that we have promoted so much and perhaps it's still a little bit unknown for the for the authors and the uh, and the public in general but uh, yeah we are we're trying to promote them um, and we hope that uh, in the next uh, years we will see a, an increase of the presence of uh, preprints also in MDPI. Okay we also have um, another anonymous question uh, aside from promotion, what do you think, it's more an opinion, what do you think makes preprints less popular to authors? Well, I think that the current academic uh, credit and recognition system is not uniformly recognizing preprints. Um, however, I think that in certain fields, and especially um, in the life sciences over the past few years, Many funders have explicitly released statements saying that preprints can be cited anywhere that journal articles can be cited in grant proposals and reports are on CVs. So I think that the recognition of preprints as a formal part of scholar communication is not uniform across all fields. However, I think that another issue that many authors bring up um, is concern about dissemination of uh, papers prior to peer review and also scooping. Um, but let me just say that I think that dissemination prior to peer review already happens at many, uh, at many conferences. And also that scooping um, is actually something that preprints I think are against because they provide a time stamped, stable, archived version of the paper. Whereas other forms of sharing, like through a private peer review process, a grant proposal or a poster at a meeting, mean that not everyone in the community has access to the, the data and can demonstrate when it was made public. Ion Silea is asking, uh, how is the copyright result in the preprint system? So uh, all authors, and uh, perhaps then I could speak about this uh, more specifically to preprints.org, but all preprint servers that I am uh, aware of allow authors to retain the copyright. So um, of course, in order to post the public the the uh, the paper publicly, they have to provide some form of license, either individually to the preprint server to display the preprint, 
or a, a Creative Commons license, which enables others to reuse the preprint as well. However, um, the application of the license doesn't change the way that copyright is owned, and it does not prevent the author from entering into subsequent copyright transfer agreements or posting a version of the paper under a different license. Um, if you're interested in this, we have an FAQ on copyright licenses and preprints on our website that was co-authored by uh, members of uh, Creative Commons, uh, which has a little bit more of a legal background than I do. Okay. Um, the next question, I think it's for Unai. Uh, Bianca Buarca is asking, um, do you believe uh, preprints could become an integrated part of MDPI in the sense that all submitted papers could be published as preprints while being under the peer review process? Well, that, that would be truly great. I mean, uh, of course, uh, when we created preprints, uh, we were expecting uh, a lot of people to join us and to, to push for the preprints. Uh, of course, the interest is not the same for everybody. Uh, there are areas where publishing uh, results uh, really fast is it's, uh, it's mandatory. Uh, there is people who is not really interested, and now we are not. Uh, I mean, we will not be forcing anyone to to publish their, their work as a preprint. But uh, for sure, it would be great if we could see that in the next years. Do you have any questions between both of you? <laughs> we don't have more questions in the QA box. Not from my side. No, Jessica, you would like to comment something? Uh, no, um, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, just, just one question that I would um, like to ask is um, how preprints, if preprints.org uh, is um, considering, you know, preprinting for books or preprinting for conference proceedings. Like, I'm curious if there's other ways of integrating preprints.org with other offerings from MVPI. That's not uh, a life still, but it's something that we are considering and uh, it's, a, it's a really good idea. I mean, the, the idea of making uh, knowledge available as soon as possible and in all the knowledge areas is what we are working for. So uh, yeah, I mean, this is something that we will definitely try to integrate into MVPI.org. So I think that uh, if there are not more uh, any additional questions uh, it's time to finish yeah. uh, once again thank you everybody for uh, joining us today i hope that this was a useful meeting for you and in case you will have any question or if you will later on decide to comment something we i will be available if you would like to go uh, to comment i uh, just uh, you just need to drop uh, an email yeah just before finishing, just, I wanted to mention if anyone is interested in a certificate of attendance, you can send us an email uh, with your name and the name of, of, the, of this webinar and we will send it to you. So thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you Nai and Jessica for your talk and see you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you.